water. Water, the most common substance on Earth. It is with us every moment of our lives. But do we know the secrets of this amazing element? Where did it come from? Who bestowed water on our planet? And why? The only such planet in the universe. Perhaps only water itself knows the answers to these questions. There is just as much water on Earth today as there was when everything began, when the world was born and acquired the shape and sensations we know so well. So what we did was what we always do here, do very careful work in a narrow field so we said, let us focus on water, but we will look at it from many angles. In the Holy Scripture, water is more than simply a physical substance. It is a certain concept, and that concept is connected in a special way with the idea of life. Nothing in the world is softer and more yielding than water. Yet it wears down the hard and strong, and none can overcome it, though anyone can conquer it. That which is yielding conquers the strong, and the soft overcomes that which is hard. Everyone knows this, but no one dares to live by it. The Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu wrote about water 2,500 years ago. I mean, water as such has been extensively studied. I mean, it is, it is well known that water has unusual properties, physical chemical properties, when compared to other liquids. No scientist has been able to explain, for example, why water's density increases below the freezing point and becomes less above freezing. Any substance contracts when it is cooled, but water does the opposite. It expands. People learned to exploit this unique property in the distant past. Inhabitants of the far north would quarry stone by pouring water into the cliff face crevices before the frosts came. In the south, people pounded wooden wedges into cracks in the rock and then doused them with water. As they swelled, the wedges would break the stone. Much later, scientists established that water in pores and capillaries is capable of creating enormous levels of pressure. In a seed, for example, it reaches 400 atmospheres at the moment of germination. That's why a plant shoot can break through asphalt with ease. It's such a small molecule as well. Um, it, it, it is very specific that these properties are, are of water. Um, and you won't, you won't find other molecules that have, that have all of the similar anomalies. Even if a single one of these anomalies were missing, life itself would not exist on the planet. Every one of water's properties is unique, and they do not easily fit into the generally accepted laws of physics. Science has not yet been able to answer the question of why water is the only substance on the planet that can exist in three states, liquid, solid, and gaseous. Why does water have the highest surface tension of all liquids? Why is it the most powerful solvent on Earth? And how, in defiance of the Earth's gravity, is water able to rise through the trunks of gigantic trees against tens of atmospheres of pressure? We have taken a great step forward. We have really understood that we know almost nothing about water. 
Therefore, it is a great step because this realization is followed by the desire to find something out. Southeast Asia. The year is 1956. The place is a secret military laboratory for developing and producing weapons of mass destruction. Work has been underway here for several years on a powerful new generation of bacteriological weapon. The scientists are discussing what properties this weapon should have at one of their protracted secret meetings. Suddenly, the session breaks off. All of the participants are taken to the hospital with symptoms of severe food poisoning. An investigation into what happened quickly hits a dead end. The scientists had consumed nothing except water from the carafes on their table. The water was tested. No harmful additives were found. Its chemical composition was H2O. And that's what the report said. Poisoning caused by ordinary water. Twenty years later, a fantastic hypothesis was put forward. A hypothesis that could explain water's unpredictable behavior. Water has memory. Experiments done in many countries around the world have shown that water receives and makes an imprint of any outside influence, remembering everything that occurs in the space that surrounds it. Any substance coming into contact with water leaves a trace in the water. Had our ancestors guessed this when they used silver vessels to turn ordinary water into healing water? It is today the best antibiotic that is made as good in Afghanistan and Iraq. The American army uses this water one atom per hundred million to kill all the germs in a wound. So the president of the United States uses this water to keep infectious uh, bugs from his hand. So I said, how can this water be? As it records information, water acquires new properties, yet its chemical composition remains unchanged. So their theory was the chemical composition of the water is important. Now, the sensational news is that that is nonsense. The structure of water is much more important than the chemical composition. The structure of water means how its molecules are organized. We can see how water molecules join together into groups. These are called clusters. Scientists came up with the idea that these clusters work as memory cells of a certain sort, in which water records the whole history of its relationship with the world, as if on magnetic tape. People don't think when you turn on the light, the water is changing. When you turn on the electric field from the power lines, the water may change. So that is the direction of research. The water, of course, remains water, but its structure, like a nervous system, reacts to any irritation. Modern instruments have made it possible to record the fact that within each of water's memory cells, there are 440,000 information panels, each of which is responsible for its own type of interaction with the environment. If you consider a cluster as a group of specific molecules, um, then it can survive only a short amount of time. But if you consider it as a structure whereby molecules can leave and other molecules come in, the cluster can last effectively for a very long time. The stability of the cluster structures confirm the hypothesis that water is capable of recording and storing information. It may be the single most malleable computer, which can, it's like a computer memory. It's the memory of information. We must know how it is arranged. It is like the alphabet. If I give you the alphabet, you don't know a word, you don't know a letter, you don't know a sentence. So 
the molecular structure is the alphabet of water and you must make a sentence out of water and you can change the sentence. In the winter of 1881, the sailing ship Laura was on a course from Liverpool to San Francisco. On the third day of the voyage, a fire broke out on board. Among those abandoning ship was the captain, Neil Carey. The water supply soon ran out and the crew experienced the torments of thirst growing by the hour. Later, when they reached shore safely after three terrible weeks adrift at sea, the captain, a man with a very level-headed attitude towards events, described what had saved them. We were dreaming of fresh water, he said. We began to imagine that the water around the lifeboat was turning from ocean blue to the greenish hue of fresh water. I summoned up my strength and scooped some up. When I tasted it, the water was fresh. Well, take a famous event. When Jesus Christ turned water into wine, he didn't add some sugar or lactose, but he imparted an absolutely special property to the water. We have carried out many experiments on the effect that quite diverse factors have on samples of water. Magnetic fields, electrical fields, various objects, and also including a human presence and human emotions. And it became clear that positive and negative human emotions are the strongest element of influence. Professor Korotkov's laboratory has conducted numerous experiments on the effect of human emotions on water. A group of people were asked to project onto a flask of water in front of them very positive emotions like love, tenderness, and concern. Then, the flask was replaced with another one, and the people were asked to project emotions of a different type – fear, aggression, hatred. After this, measurements were taken on the samples. The water exhibited changes that were clearly in one direction or another. So love increases water's energy levels and stabilizes the water while aggressive emotions reduce the energy and make radical changes in the water. I hope to show people through my research that water has a memory of its own. Dr. Emoto's laboratory does research on water samples, which are subjected to various forms of outside influence. The impressions made upon the water are recorded by swiftly freezing it in a cryogenic chamber. This is what water heated in a microwave oven looks like. This is the effect of a mobile telephone. Somebody said thank you to this water. Excuse me. You disgust me. With modern technology, it is possible to structurize water artificially. When seeds were grown under laboratory conditions using this kind of water, the soy sprouts had six times greater photon radiation than when ordinary water was used. Using structurized water makes vegetables ripen faster and increases the amount of useful microelements and vegetable proteins several fold. If we look at the shoots, the treated ones were long, even, and strong, while the untreated ones were short, thin, and weak. If we look at the plants today, those from the selected seeds have all ripened, but the ones from non-selected seeds have not. We have to say that using structurized water really does affect the growth of vegetables and fruits. For the purposes of irrigation, 20% less of this type of water is needed than when using ordinary water. No fertilizer was added to the soil or the water. The chemical composition remained the same, H2O. The only thing that had changed was its structure. At the present time, scientists can answer the question of how this happens, but science does not yet have an answer to the question of why. 
Depending on age, a human being is made up of 70 to 90% water. An adult drinks approximately 2.5 liters of water each day in order to sustain his normal life functions. Another 1.5 liters is absorbed through the skin during bathing or showering. Water makes a long and difficult journey before arriving in our homes. It used to be common knowledge that a settlement could only occur where there was a natural source of water. Today, whether or not there is water in a place is of no importance because we transport water for thousands of miles using high pressure. In nature, rivers and streams always flow along a smoothly curving course. But any water supply system has multiple right angle turns. The natural structure of the water breaks down more and more with each such turn. Water from a water supply system which flows into our homes through pipes has various forms, crystals of various forms, but they are all deformed. That is, it may look like this. It can look like this or have these crystals in many other arrangements, but you won't see any symmetry or beauty. Water that flows in a floor panel heating system is devitalized and rotten. It sucks energy out of the people, plants, and animals living in that house. It actually steals the energy. It is well known that the water supply in many large cities is a closed loop system. After undergoing aggressive chemical purification and passing through powerful filters, the water in these systems is returned to our homes, still remembering the chemicals and the violence it was subjected to. Even stronger, however, is the informational pollution that the water accumulates as it flows down miles of long pipes through thousands and thousands of houses and apartments. We pollute water spiritually, and this happens on a huge scale. Why? The water adopts all of the hatred, all of the malice, the stress. The water is almost dead by the time it enters our body. Our Earth is a gigantic container of water in which all forms of life arose, and every living thing is itself essentially a container of water. With modern technologies, we can reach far into outer space, and as we attempt to discover life on other planets, the first thing we look for is water. There is no life on Earth without water. And one of the big questions is whether or not, in case that there should be comparable life on other planets, this would also be based on the presence of water. There is strong belief that the first living organisms were in the water, and only much, much later did organisms develop that could live outside of the water. I don't think that this is at all a coincidence. It is absolutely no accident that the opening lines of the Bible mention water, where it talks about the creation of the world, of life, and of man. It has to do with water first and foremost. Like sculptures that have not yet been created are present in a piece of clay, so the images of all future living organisms were present in the water. Water merely brought to life a pre-existing conception. But for any process to begin requires an impulse.
wise men of ancient times believed that the impulse for life to arise was a primordial divine spark. This spark imprinted in the water the sequence of future development. The entire course of evolution provides evidence of this. Every species of living being, from the simplest bacteria to mammals, strove to achieve its own perfection. Science most likely will never find out the exact process by which Adam was created, what went with what and in what proportions. But the Quran, for example, says that water played a part in this by the will of God. I think, I think that scientists should look more closely at how water interacts with their molecules. At a molecular level, it creates the structure of DNA. We wouldn't have the DNA helix without water. It creates the structure of proteins. So our bodies wouldn't work um, without the water. Every seed, every embryo begins its life exclusively in water. Amniotic fluid plays a role in the embryo's development and preservation. It is the surrounding water, like a universal computer, that reveals any biological program. And thus water is also the only thing that can change it. The preacher wrote long ago, is there anything whereof it may be said, see, this is new? It hath been already of old time, which was before us. And Jacob took him rods of green poplar and of the hazel and chestnut tree and pilled white strakes in them and made the white appear which was in the rods. And he set the rods which he had pilled before the flocks in the gutters, in the watering troughs where the flocks came to drink, and the flocks conceived before the rods, and brought forth cattle, ring-straked, speckled, and spotted. We subjected water to superweak magnetic field impulses. These fields are tens of thousands of times weaker than the Earth's natural magnetic field. That means they are negligibly small from the standpoint of modern science. Fish were introduced into water that had been treated in this way, and the fish soon produced an unusual hatch of small fry. They differed radically from other fish to which they were related, though they looked as much alike as twins. Gray stripes appear on the belly of all these males at once, along with colored spots, which had not been observed previously. These are called phenotype changes, and it is of fundamental importance that these changes appear not just in some of the treated fish, but in all of them at the same time. And these phenotype changes that we caused are not a hypothesis, they occurred in practice. The experiment resulted in changes not only in the outward appearance of the fish, but also in their behavior. They began to react to outside stimuli in the same way. It was as if the whole school had acquired a collective mind. A whole important area of problems came up, which had not been studied whatsoever. Therefore, it was decided that it would suffice to establish even just the fact that behavior could change the form of animals using only water, which fact, in and of itself, is very significant. If water has such a strong effect, that is, we shouldn't make it public without thoroughly studying this. In 1932, sensational news traveled around the world. The American physicists Harold Urey and Albert Osborne had discovered that, in addition to ordinary water, heavy water also exists in nature. Deuterium 2O. The splitting of deuterium was the basis for creation of the most destructive bomb, the hydrogen bomb.
Now, everybody knows very well what radioactive radiation can cause, but it turns out that there are other even more awesome effects. Rather more horrific is the change in the structure of water, covering huge areas, thousands of miles larger than the nuclear weapons testing grounds. It made no difference where the test was carried out, in the atmosphere, on the ground, or underground. Colossal changes occur in the water, and the water's memory changes, and people drink that water, animals drink it, and suddenly terrible changes take place. When the explosion occurs, waves are formed, which die out fairly quickly in the ground, but the water may continue to fluctuate for another 30 days. Swinging like a pendulum, the waves create a new and pathological ordering in the water. It has been noted that the number of suicides rises abruptly after such tests. By a factor of two, two and a half, three, medical experts had absolutely no explanation for this, but we could understand it. We showed the brain is made of water, about 85%. So these changes take place in the brain, and a conflict between the water structures arises. The bioplasm of the brain is disrupted, and the result is that the person is deprived even of such an extremely important incentive as the drive to live. In ancient legends, the hero would always be sent to fetch dead water in a place from which there is no return. According to tradition, the only sea on earth in which there is no life came into existence where the destroyed cities Sodom and Gomorrah had been located, the Dead Sea. There really is no such thing as dead water. Water gives life. It always has this original vitality. It may be used more correctly or less correctly, but it is always positive. How a person handles water, if he approaches the water with good thoughts or blesses it and says thank you to it, the quality of the water will improve and the water will have a positive effect on a person and his body. According to the Chronicles, in 1472, Abbot Carl Gustinsis was arrested on the basis of a false denunciation and interrogated in connection with having caused a certain prominent lady to fall ill. While he was being held in a dungeon, the abbot was given only a crust of stale bread every day, along with a dipper of rotten, stinking water. After 40 days, the prison warden noticed that Father Carl not only had not gone into decline, but he even seemed to have gained health and strength, which only served to convince the inquisitors that the abbot had connections with dark forces. Later, Carl Gustensis confessed under brutal torture that he had recited a prayer over the rotten water he was given, thanking the Lord for bestowing these trials upon him. After that, the water tasted bland and turned fresh and clear. We have two containers of emulsified crude oil, which is a byproduct of oil production, a stable combination of water and oil, which remain bound in this state for years. The test sample is irradiated. The element will treat one container for seven days, making the water molecules lessen their contact with the oil molecules. After four days, we compare the test sample and the control. The water has separated from the oil, at the boundary between the water and oil phases, there are crater-like formations. This means that the separation process is continuing. The fields we use to influence the water are comparable in intensity with the electromagnetic field of the human heart. On the seventh day of treatment, the experiment is finished the water has completely separated from the oil. Experts estimate that oil men have accumulated around a billion tons of emulsified crude oil. It cannot be used for industrial purposes. Ultimately, 
they get rid of the emulsion, pouring it right onto the ground. And then, horrible sludge lakes are formed in the oil fields. In the language of the Pemon Indian tribe in Venezuela, Roraima is translated as the mother of all waters. A group of Russian biophysicists set out for this destination in January 2005 to collect a unique sample of water, which scientists say has never been in direct contact with human beings. Such water exists in only one place on Earth, in Venezuela. According to one hypothesis, a continent called Gondwana existed in the southern hemisphere during the Paleozoic era. Powerful tectonic processes occurring in the Earth's crust 3.5 million years ago split it into several parts. As a result of these changes, some segments of the continent sank, while those resting on granite substrates remained at their previous level. Elevated plateaus were formed, which the Indians called tepuis, meaning pillars. Roraima is the largest of them. It's a really remote place, very hard to get to. Three days of travel through the savanna and then the jungles. Then you climb an 800-meter wall. It takes a certain amount of enthusiasm. Therefore, we can say that the water we have there is in a unique, virgin state. There is always a large cloud over Roraima. As evening approaches, a light haze appears. When the moon comes out from behind the mountains, the mist begins to glow with an even blue light. And in that light, it is visible how fine droplets of moisture are hanging in the still air. The slightest breath of a breeze and this watery dust forms into drops. This is the origin of the rain which rushes down in countless waterfalls. So today is January 30th, 2005. Water collection number 16. Then we shall pack it all up in foil. And in this form, this water will hold its energy for several days with the air of these places. Then we'll arrive in St. Petersburg and we'll calmly carry out our laboratory analysis several thousand miles away. And only then, will we be able to draw any conclusions? Professor Korotkov's laboratory has developed an instrument that can determine the energetics of water. It works on the basis of the Curlian effect. Everything that enters a strong electromagnetic field begins to emit light. The greater energy the object possesses, the brighter it shines. The water from Venezuela was compared with ordinary drinking water. We can say that this water is not double, not triple, but it is 40,000 times more active. So these are really two fundamentally different substances. And water of this type, this water, which immediately activates the body, it activates the whole system. That's why there, where the Indians, despite the deprivation in which they live, live very long lives and are very happy. They absolutely do not want civilization to come to them.
In the late autumn of 1632, a poor farmer named Gens from the village of Enningen in Hessen, an orphan who didn't remember his parents or where he was born, set off for southern Italy to seek a better lot. His route ran through the city of Waldschut am Rhein in the eparchy of Constance. Suddenly, Genst was literally stabbed by the feeling that these places were very directly related to him. It was as if the shepherd's legs led him where he should go, which was into a grove. Entering it, Genst looked around. Not far away, a spring was coming right out of the ground. The young man approached it, bent down, and drank the water. Many years later, he told his grandchildren the story of how the water had given him back his memory, so that he recollected these places, and his father and mother, and the house in which he was born. Modern science maintains that the water structure of each person's body is identical to the structure of the water in the place where they were born. Therefore, our internal connection to our place of birth is preserved throughout our life. And that means that the concept of homeland has not only a lofty poetical meaning, but also a quite specific physical content. Nowhere in the world is water the same. Breaking its way to the surface through minerals and ores, water assimilates the vibrations of the soil and information about its specific biological and energetic features. We tested a sample of purified municipal water, which is sold in large bottles, and the producer puts a label on them which says it is the best water in the world. But it is empty and dead. True, it's pure and it's good, and some minerals have been added, but this is dead water in which there is no energetics and there is no life. Most likely, people do not sense any particular difference between naturally pure and artificially purified water. But any animal will always choose water from a spring because this water is loaded with natural energies. Not long ago, yet another unique property of natural water was discovered. It turns out that such natural water is flammable. The burning of natural water, the water itself burns, and the reason it burns is precisely that it is structured in a special way natural water is. Burning, in rigorous scientific terms, is a process of oxidation in which heat and light are given off. In the case of water, it burns at the temperature of the environment, and the light emitted can be recorded using super-sensitive instruments. In burning, you have oxygen being continuously activated, and some organic matter is continuously burning, so the burning of water is a process that happens over an extended period of time, because if it were a process that happened more quickly, then it would have already burned up all the water on Earth. On June 30, 1940, a note was tossed into the Soviet embassy in Germany. Its author requested to be contacted immediately. If this does not happen, my work with Heydrich will go to waste, wrote agent Willy Lechmann, codenamed Breitenbach. He hastened to report on secret testing facilities and work being done on making synthetic gasoline from brown coal using water. Back in 1913, Kaiser Wilhelm had ordered Franz Fischer, a leading chemist, to make sure Germany had liquid fuel supplies. Not having its own oil could put Germany in a weak position in the impending war. By 1941, German scientists had succeeded in obtaining fuel by hydrogenating coal. This fuel, however, was 10 to 12 times more expensive than natural fuel refined from oil and it was of such poor quality that it badly damaged the military vehicles in which it was used. 
After the war, these efforts to produce fuel using water were abandoned as futile. For the past 15 years, the researcher Jean Gohua has been working to create fuel of this type. Now we shall demonstrate for everyone the process of preparing emulsified diesel fuel and show its two aspects. One aspect is increased energy and the other is reduction of exhaust gases. This is fuel taken from an automobile, structurized water. If we take the proportions, it is 79% diesel fuel, 20% water, and 1% emulsifying agent. What was added here is water. Zhang shows us that what is added to the fuel really is water. Now we shall add the 1% emulsifying agent. An emulsified solution resembling milk forms immediately. We pour the emulsified fuel into the car and use it for propulsion. Measured over the long term, there was a 5% increase in power with over 20% fuel economy. Our government views this as very important. I think that not even all chemists remember this aspect. If you take gasoline and completely dry it out, it always contains some quantity of water. And if you give it a special treatment to remove all of the water from the gasoline, the gasoline will not burn. This was known already in the 19th century. To burn anything whatsoever, there has to be at least some quantity of water. Water has a direct effect on our brains. There is a legend among the Persian Sufis. Once upon a time, a wise man said that the day would come when all the water in the world, except for what had been specially collected, would disappear. And then different water would replace it. But anyone who drank the new water would lose his mind. Only one man took the prophecy seriously and began to store up water. But the day that had been predicted did come, and every body of water emptied out. The man who had listened to the wise man drank water from his supply. And then, the bodies of water and wells filled up with water again. People thirstily drank this water, and every one of them went crazy. But the man who had listened to the wise man continued to drink water only from his own supply and kept his sanity and he was the only sane person left among the madmen, and therefore he was called crazy. And then he poured his reserves of real water, the old water, onto the ground, and he drank the new water and lost his mind, and the madmen decided that he had become sane. A major part of our, our brain, of our brains of water. So the water and the easy movement of the water molecules and so on will leave part of that imprint. So yes, to some extent, the water is implicated in the patterning of the information in the brain. Now when you look at organs, say the heart or the lung or muscles or the brain, then all that you can see in a simple NMR experiment is the water in these organs. The water, your head is full of water. There is nothing else but water, almost. Let's imagine that here we have a human being and here we have water. This water contains many different types of information. If we introduce this water into the human body, then that human body 
will assimilate this information, which may change the person's characteristics. Human being, and uh, that may change. Let us see how this type of water affects human blood. The doctor is drawing blood from a patient's finger. Using a special microscope, we shall be able to see the condition of her body from this drop. These are red blood cells and they've lost their electrical charge, so they're all stuck together in a formation called a rouleau. Here's a huge symplast. Symplasts are associated with heart disease and uh, arthritis and lung disease and many other conditions that could be coming in the future. The doctor asks the patient to drink a small amount of structured water. After 12 minutes, the doctor again draws blood from the patient and studies it. So you can see that the cells then become buoyant, they become slippery, and they have their electrical charge, so they repel each other. That allows them to carry oxygen, and it means that we're changing the pH of the blood back to an aerobic environment rather than an anaerobic environment. I think that's utterly amazing that that a water could, that just drinking water could do that. Traditional Eastern medicine has been based for many centuries on the vibrations and resonance of the body's water content. The pulse indicates if the resonance tone is right. It is believed that the pulse may be strong, weak, cold, or hot. On the basis of this, an experienced physician carries out a kind of energy scan of the body, makes a diagnosis, and prescribes treatment. We do not heal with water because a person, the human body, is water. The person simply reads the mantras or prayers in order to correct the bad water he has inside. How this hidden effect works is not known. In all of the world's religions, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism, it is the practice to recite a prayer before taking food or to consecrate the food during major religious holidays. How often do we stop and think, what for? And how did the certainty arise in such dissimilar religions that this is the right thing to do? Why did something that science is only now trying to understand seem obvious to our ancestors? It turns out that the frequency of vibrations in the prayers of any religion uttered in any language is 8 hertz, which corresponds to the frequency of the oscillations of the Earth's magnetic field. Therefore, a prayer, pronounced with love, creates a harmonic structure in water, which is an ingredient of absolutely all food. We now have some idea about how this happens through the structurization of water clusters, water molecules. Therefore, we can take some purely practical advice from this. To sit down at the table in a very good mood and under no circumstances to dine with cruel or aggressive-minded people because this will have a direct destructive effect on our health. In 1995, Dr. Masaru Imoto was the first one to record musical impressions on water. In Dr. Imoto's laboratory, they presented water with different types of music, after which they froze the water and then under the microscope could clearly see the crystals that the water had formed. Here is what the music of Bach looks like. Mozart. Beethoven. Heavy rock. In 
иногда это всплески определенные эмоциональные, которые приводят. Sometimes it's just certain eruptions, emotional ones, which cause such absolutely negative results. I can't recall a case in which such a negative spewing out of emotions as this happened at a classical music concert. Experiments show that aggression causes a sharp change in water's memory. Such water can provoke an aggressive state in hitherto calm people. Strange as it might seem, evil interacts more easily and simply. Apparently, this has to do with the sensitivities of human beings who always feel negative things more acutely. Dr. Emoto conducted another groundbreaking experiment. He placed rice into three glass beakers and covered it with water. And then every day for a month, he said thank you to one beaker. You're an idiot to the second. And the third one he completely ignored. After one month, the rice that had been thanked began to ferment, giving off a strong, pleasant aroma. The rice in the second beaker turned black. And the rice that was ignored began to rot. Dr. Emoto feels that this experiment provides an important lesson especially with regard to how we treat children. We should take care of them, give them attention, and converse with them. Indifference does the greatest harm. It may not always be easy to do, and almost always it takes practice. Practical experience show that hatred, rage, and even annoyance not only exert a destructive influence on other people, but they also give feedback. Intellectually, at the level of thoughts, a person who sends negative thoughts is polluting his own water, of which his body is 75 to 90 percent composed, and giving it a negative charge. Many laboratories around the world have repeatedly carried out an experiment that produces similar results. Water from a single container was divided into two portions. One part was subjected to an outside influence that changed the structure and properties of that water. The water in the second flask acquired the same structure and the same properties after a certain period of time. Even if the two portions of water were a significant distance removed from each other. The water has a very important uh, photographic memory, we can say that, and also you can imprint it with very subtle energies, even from 10,000 kilometers. Does that mean that remote communication occurs between human beings? who are essentially structures composed of water? In February 2005, Professor Vecheslav Zvonikov and a group of colleagues conducted an experiment to confirm or disconfirm the hypothesis that remote communication between people is possible. Two people are 10,000 miles apart. One is in Moscow, the other in South America near the city of Santa Elena. Here we have the virtual brain of the experiment's participants. During the 15 minutes before the experiment begins, there are no visible correlations. The least change in posture, pulse, or respiratory frequency is recorded. EKGs and EEGs are taken. Suddenly, the instruments register distinct changes. 
the two people separated by this enormous distance have somehow tuned themselves to the same wave. The instruments show synchronization of certain areas of their brains, of breathing patterns, and pulses. How can this be explained? We don't yet have any answers to that question. So far, this is a scientific mystery. There is a hypothesis that the body's liquids play a part in this. Most likely, and we do have a good deal of data to confirm this, liquids within the body also carry out a sort of information transmission function. So therefore, our actions every day is very important. And our actions are related to nature, to the whole cosmos. So what one does doesn't just affect themselves. It affects other people and it affects the whole universe. We studied water during solar eclipses and when comet Schumacher-Levy was passing in those periods of time. And it turned out that a tissue culture in water, when a solar eclipse is in the offing a week ahead of time before the eclipse, when everything is still far ahead, it already begins to fade. The water showed a direct connection to the event. The system of the universe exists as a single perfect organism. All of its parts, including us and our Earth, are inseparably bound together by huge streams of information. And on our planet, water plays the key role in how the information is exchanged. In effect, it is the medium through which all nature is governed. The Chinese chronicles tell about the Taoist hermit Shang Shun, who is known to have met repeatedly with Genghis Khan for lengthy conversations. Once, when the country was being ravaged by an unknown epidemic, the ruler of Beijing asked the hermit to protect the people. He prayed and the sickness retreated. In reply to numerous expressions of gratitude, the hermit said, prayer is not a thing. All it requires is faith. Exactly, exactly. Many people think that thought or intention, the word we use is intention, can be imprinted on the water. That is a possibility. Like prayer, if you go to Lourdes, is it prayer that is imprinted on the water? Yes, sir. The Holy Scripture contains these marvelous words, nothing shall be impossible to him who believes. If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove. Here the mountain is just a metaphor, of course, but it helps us understand the power of faith. All of mankind's sacred books contain stories about people who were able to create miracles because of their profound spiritual knowledge. Legend tells us that the sea parted before Moses because of his unflinching faith that the Lord would not abandon his people. We have totally indisputable evidence that prayer influences sick people to get better, and it's caused absolutely fantastical recoveries, such as the spread of gangrene suddenly stopping in a person who already had it. With holy water, when it is poured over sick animals or a dying plant, they revive. 
Those are the facts, and no physical chemist currently is able to understand it. They simply can't. January the 18th. It is the eve of the Orthodox Feast of the Epiphany. Two flasks are filled with ordinary tap water. Early in the morning, one of them is set inside the church, near the vessel over which the sacrament of sanctification is to be performed. Every year on January 19th, the faithful and even non-believers hurry into churches to pick up some of the baptismal water. It is believed to possess extraordinary properties. In order to confirm or refute this, the two flasks were taken to the laboratory for study immediately after the service. Here, the water was frozen in a cryogenic chamber and photographed under the microscope. The crystals of the tap water looked like a chaotic, diffused spot. while the water that had been in the church had the rectilinear symmetrical form of a six-pointed star. It is well known that holy water has a very powerful and stable structure. This water can pass its properties. Take only 10 grams of it and dilute it in 60 liters of common water and the whole amount will have the properties of the holy water. Perhaps scientists will tell us sometime what prayer is. Perhaps scientists will tell us sometime what happens with human nature under the influence of divine grace. In my view, what Jesus did represented an informational influence on the water. He acted with his spirituality. He acted through higher spiritual powers. And it is now quite reasonable to imagine changing water in such a way that it would become fairly firm. It could be radiation, but could it be only subtle energy? And we are very interested in how subtle energy can be detected by a material. In our time, everybody is sure that weather on the planet is determined by cyclones and anticyclones. We accept the weatherman's daily forecasts as inevitable. Actually, we are waiting for water to make its appearance. Evaporating and turning into whimsical clouds and towering thunderheads, it creates the architectonics of the sky. The countless shades of sunrise and sunset, the rainbows that shoot across the sky, all of them result from the refraction of light rays by the moisture in the atmosphere. Clouds carry this moisture over great distances and it spills down as rain. Rain, hail, snow and mist, winds and storms, gales and hurricanes. All of these complex processes depend on water's mood. We try to second guess how it is going to behave and where on the earth it will bestow its favors, and where it will unleash its wrath. The most we can do is to observe these processes from space, but only observe them. But how alluring the thought is of subjugating the weather. What a sweet bait that is for human vanity. Many peoples have preserved the practice of influencing weather and atmospheric phenomena. These rituals are carefully passed down, unchanged from generation to generation.
если мои подношения. If my tributes have been convincing enough, if I have chosen the right time and the right place, and have recited the mantras correctly, and from a pure heart, then the Lord of the water gives us water. We do not place much trust in actions which may be met with a smile these days. Could it be that just one human, not some huge modern laboratory with the latest technologies, but just a single person, could influence a natural process solely by the force of his desire and intentions? And there was an outdoor wedding outside a museum in Ontario. And, um, well, we didn't bring umbrellas, but some people did, and the sky was all overcast and the rain started to come. It was half an hour before the wedding, and it started to rain, all the umbrellas went up, and so I and three students, two other students, said, okay, let's meditate for, uh, for um, better weather. Within a minute, an opening in the clouds came, and the sun just shone right down in this area. Only, not all over, just shone right down this area. By the summer of 1991, Israel had had no rain for two years. The water in the country's only freshwater lake, Lake Kinneret, had fallen 15 centimeters below the critical level. Then, 10,000 Israelis gathered at the Wailing Wall to pray for rain. On the third day, rain came down on the country in torrents. Many people explain this fact as a simple coincidence. Belief in coincidence is neither scientific nor religious. From a scientific standpoint, there is scientific determinism. While from a religious standpoint, there are things that are done which have an influence on the outcome. Coincidence is a way in which people try to escape bearing any responsibility. Just as the cry of a bird in the mountains can cause a powerful avalanche, or the motion of a butterfly's wing can change the weather over an entire continent, likewise, people can launch global processes solely by the power of their thought. And that is no exaggeration. Not a single scientist who is familiar with systems theory doubts that. It is entirely a question of waiting for a moment when the system is in a state of instability. In a phase of instability, the motion of thought alone is sufficient for the system to start to change. I do not always see it. When my own mistake or sin comes back to me in another guise, although essentially it is a single unit, whatever it is that I did wrong returns to me, not as punishment, but as a result. With all the abundance of water on the planet, less than 1% of it is available fresh water. This supply has been practically unchanged in the course of human history, while the population has been constantly growing. The world has never seen as many people as there are on the planet today, 6.5 billion. There would have been enough fresh water for everybody if it were not for the severe attack of the human civilization. Look, imagine, if there will simply not be any water, that it will go away deep underground. Who shall give you water which will spout freely from the ground and be easy for you to reach? Today, more than a billion people of the Earth lack access to safe drinking water. Over five million people, half of them children, die from this reason each year. This is 10 times more than perish from wars each year. 
If this problem is left unsolved, water may become a source of international conflict in the 21st century. Already now, it is gradually attaining the status of a base resource, which is beginning to figure in the political dialogue among countries and peoples. See, we talk a lot about an upcoming oil crisis because we will run out of oil. But I think it is even more important that we worry about the water, that we don't run into a water crisis. According to UN data, around 10 million tons of oil annually pours into the world's oceans. Along the U.S. Atlantic coast are buried 90,000 containers of radioactive waste with 100 kilocuries of activity, while the European part has 500 kilocuries. Countries with sea access dump industrial, construction, and radioactive waste into the ocean. As it is dumped and descends through a column of water, some of the polluting substances dissolve and change not only the quality of the water, but also its memory. The ocean is also still capable of erasing these memories because of its salinity. But nonetheless, the dilution effect is there. It also needs to be discussed and studied. Because at very great levels of dilution, sometimes a memory begins to have even a stronger influence than at slight, so to speak, levels of dilution with high concentrations. We have to pay attention to this. This is a very difficult period of our planetary existence. Today, we've already plowed up all the lands possible, and we've lost 33% of our green covering and half the plankton in the ocean. So the problem might seem to be far off, but there is water everywhere. In the past year, the temperature of the cold, deep sea waters under the Gulf Stream fell by one degree. In the past nine years, the rate of melting of Greenland's icebergs has tripled. In the past 30 years, the destructive force of hurricanes has doubled. The number of natural disasters is rising. In the decade from 1973 through 1982, 1,500 disasters occurred worldwide. In 1983 to 1992, there were 3,500. In 1993 to 2002, there were 6,000. 226,000 people died or disappeared during the December 2004 tsunami in Southeast Asia, while half a million were left homeless. The October 2005 flood in Europe left 200,000 people homeless. Over 1,300 people died during Hurricane Katrina in August 2005. One million people were left homeless. Almost four million people have died in natural disasters during the past 30 years, while 4.5 billion people were affected. If you ask the ordinary man on the street today whether or not man and human activity are to blame for the increased number of hurricanes on the planet and their increased destructive force, I think that every other person will say yes, this is a consequence of human activity. I think that uh, what's happening in our world today 
uh, all the uh, tsunamis and the freak weather everywhere and uh, the terrorism and the fear that is uh, gripping us, all of the things that are happening uh, is a result of unhealthy individual health. And it affects the other way too, okay. And also I think it's, uh, it, it's a result of water being polluted. The phenomenon of structural memory enables water to take an impression of everything that happens around it and to connect all living systems together. And each one of us is a link in an endless chain of information transmission. But in addition, each of us is also a source of information. Every one of our actions, a thought, an emotion, an uttered word, separates from us and becomes part of the overall energo-informational environment. Informational dirt is poisoning the water, accumulating layer by layer in its memory. If that process were to continue endlessly, the water could, in essence, lose its mind. But it is endowed with a self-cleansing capacity. This occurs at the moment of phase transition, when it vaporizes, and then condenses and falls as rain, or when it freezes, and then melts. Shaking off the informational grime, water preserves its basic structure, that is, the program for life. Einstein, for example, once said, I would like to know what he was thinking, meaning God. Everything else is just details, but I would like to know how he created this world. Everything begins in water. In a certain sense, we can say that everything originates in water, and in water, everything comes to an end. For all peoples, a person must be clean in order to stand before God. In all of the world's religions, water is a kind of intermediary that unites man with the Creator. The Jews perform ablutions or cleansing with water in mikvahs. For Muslims, ablution is a prerequisite for prayer. If we trace the references to water in the Holy Scripture, they are often associated with the idea of purification. This is most vivid, of course, in the narrative of the baptism of the Israelites in the River Jordan in the time of the prophet John, John the Baptist, the forerunner. John baptized with the baptism of repentance, and the image and symbol of people's repentance was immersion in the river. In the Christian church, there is the sacrament of baptism. First of all, why is it a sacrament? Because it remains ultimately hidden from us. What happens with a person at the moment of baptism? It is known that the divine energy, which in the language of the church we call grace, descends upon the person. There have been many wars on religious grounds in human history, but in our experiment, water reacted to individual words that had a religious content by forming beautiful crystals. This means that the conception of our nature coincides with each religion. The Christian Prayer The Buddhist Prayer The Muslim Prayer Dr. Emoto presumes that serious crimes are committed most of all in areas where people curse the most often. Idiot. I hate you. Laboratory containers of water were inscribed with hieroglyphs denoting words and the names of well-known people. Love. Hope. 
soul. Mother Teresa. Hitler. Dr. Emoto's numerous experiments aimed at finding the word that cleanses water most powerfully have shown that it is not just one word, but a combination of two. Love and gratitude. The universe was created by the absolute, by the source that produced all of which exists, all its material manifestations. Each of us has an element from the water of the primeval ocean. Our every word is like a water drop, a medium of thought, a source of information. And we are all here to repay the absolute with love and gratitude. Thank you. 